So check on that. Uh, let's see. You're the only one that was the first test. I, no, no, I graded the test last one. That's where I explained that I try to take points off rather than add points so it's to the benefit by group up. Check to make sure the points total the right, that entered on angel the right way. Um, solutions there. section now. All right, we're doing very much the same general pattern that we did in Physics 1. We started in Physics 1 with the kinematics, particularly of particles. We're going to continue with particles, particle motion, but now we're going to do the kinetics, but still of particles. So we're not worried so much yet with the size of things. There might be a problem that could come up where certain dimensions apply, but in general, what we're concerned with is whatever it is we're working with is represented by a single point. If you wish, you can look at that as the, the center of gravity or something. In fact, that, that may even help when we get to, uh, when we finish up the particle motion and start looking again at rigid body motion. But that's the type of thing we're going to look at now. Uh, kinematics, if you remember, in general, only we really only dealt with four things. What were they? Only had four. There's four. This is we've done four weeks already. Only dealt with four things. That's one thing a week. That's all you had to remember. One thing a week. That's all I asked. Except of Pat, I asked more of Pat, but he, he can deliver. Recycle. What were the four things we've been working on so far? Nothing else. Just those four things. All right. Time, velocity, acceleration, and position. Yeah, I'm no wonder you're my favorite student. Position, velocity, acceleration, and the time during which those things occur. That's all we've been looking at. Well, there have been variation, but most of those variations really were just different coordinate systems and uh, different changes like that. So now we're going to look at, at uh, how we affect those changes. And for the most part, uh, you'll recognize it as Newton's first law. Simply put, that when we have unbalanced forces, that will cause masses to accelerate. Basically, these problems are either uh, we have a an acceleration we want, so we try to figure out what forces will give us that, or we have forces that are already given, we want to see what is the resultant acceleration from that. We'll, uh, we'll do two other methods, just like we did in Physics 1. Uh, this is our first method of solving kinetics problems. Two others will come directly from that, if you remember from Physics 1. At least those of you who had it with me, we certainly did this. We'll also look at the work energy method and the impulse momentum method. But for now, our working equation will be this. 
and you can do it in uh, whatever, whatever, whatever form you prefer. I don't care. They all mean the same. They all carry the very simple idea that we need to take into account all of the forces acting on an object. Well, let me let me uh, let me refine that a little bit. It's all pertinent forces. There will be some and some problems that just aren't important to us. Uh, for example, if we're pushing something along a level, frictionless track, then the force of gravity really doesn't come into the problem. It's an odd force on the object, it's just not a pertinent force in that problem. And so we don't need to, don't need to concern ourselves with it. So this is our vector representation. of Newton's first law. Actually, I guess technically Newton's first law is that which we use in statics. So, let's, uh, I don't I don't see them as different laws anyway, but everybody else does, so we'll, we'll play their little game. Uh, the second law is actually the one that says of acceleration. The first law is the one that says if those forces sum to zero, then there'll be no acceleration. That's the one we're using in statics and mechanics and materials. In this class, though, we're concerned with the possibility that things will accelerate. In fact, uh, there will always be some acceleration in all of our problems here. Doesn't mean that this doesn't apply because we also have the, cons the, the, the realization that at any time we can have acceleration in one direction but not in others and then we have uh, Newton's second law applying in one direction, but not a Newton's first law applying in another, if any one of those are zero. So that's a, a scalar representation then, if you will, of uh, Newton's second laws we're gonna look at. It. Newton's second law to the minus one. I guess I, this isn't two to the minus one, so I ought to put the whole thing there. Newton's second law, the inverse of, of Newton's second law is essentially that the mass of an object can be defined by the forces applied to it and its resultant acceleration. And in fact, that's just how mass is, is defined. Uh, particularly well in the SI system, particularly badly in the English system. Let's see what that means to us right now. We've got to get the forces right in this class, in this section of the classes. If we don't have the forces right, we're not doing the right problem. So one of the forces we have to get right, and luckily isn't too terribly difficult, is that force that we call weight. It's the force of gravity acting on a mass. So, a couple things we have to worry about. Uh, 
Uh, one in this class, and I don't remember anybody doing this wrong in, in, uh, in Physics 1 with me, but I have some guys here I didn't have for Physics 1. So let me remind you that this force is down. Sounds kind of obvious, however, I know there are lots of high well-meaning high school physics teachers who told students if you have a problem on an incline, transfer that problem to a non-incline problem and just incline the force of gravity. Anybody have that for physics, uh, high school physics? That? No. You wouldn't admit it now anyway. Oh, nothing. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, it is. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, for one, it, it really hasn't changed the problem any, but there's a lot of, your high school teacher did it? We have the same one. Oh. Um, I don't know that you can move the earth over to the side without permission. I think, I think you at least have to clear that with uh, some higher being. So good, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we won't see that. In, uh, when I taught this, this class to about 100 at RPI, maybe, maybe 10 or 15 did it that way, had, had high school instructors that, that had them do it that way. They meant well, but it's just uh, I don't know. I don't see what it accomplished other than befuddling the reality of it, and we hate to have reality befuddled. Uh, in the SI system, this is all real easy because we uh, have previously defined. our unit of mass have previously measured the gravitational field strength. A um, couple of you are taking physics three, right? Talked about field strength yet? Electrostatic fields and the like. This is exactly the same type of thing. That's really what G is. It's a measure of the gravitational field strength, just like you talked about this. The, the uh, electrostatic, and we'll talk about the magnetic field strength. Then this is defined then as the unit of force, and of course is one newton. Remember the convention is, if a unit's spelled out, which it almost never is, it's not capitalized. If it's abbreviated and it's someone's name, it's always capitalized. Um, there probably are a few exceptions, but none leap to mind. So easiest thing to do is just do Newton. But this is actually the definition of a Newton. And just to prove that the, uh, the universe has poetry to it, What's something that weighs about a Newton? I know my physics one guys know. Do you other, you newbies know? Something that just as a common everyday household object that weighs about a Newton. Just so you know about what it is. Huh? A fig? <laughs> That's too much poetry in the universe. Yeah, it's about an apple. It's, it's about the weight of an apple, depending upon the size of the apple and like, but it's about that. And of course, that is the uh, dropping out apple that uh, twigged Newton onto what was going on with gravity uh, back in the 1600s. So, uh, that, that's pretty easy. We just now have uh, essentially what's a conversion factor that one Newton equals Actually, sorry, this isn't one Newton. How come nobody was paying attention? You expect me to? 
this is uh, 9.8 newtons because we define one newton as one kilogram meter per second squared. Did anybody catch that? Jake, you just out thought it. All right, so we have that, that definition of a Newton. I was getting uh, messed up here because in the English system, it's a horrible mess. Leading to what is probably one of the silliest units ever, ever uh, devised. This was okay, this all worked so nicely because the mass was defined first. The meter and the second were all defined independently, and then everything else was defined from there. That's not the way it was done in the English system. In the English system, we still use W equals mg, but the things were defined differently. The things that go with it are defined differently. For example, the unit of force is known as the pound. And when we colloquially use the word pound, that's generally what we mean. But if you'll notice, there's a little subscript F on there because independently defined in the uh, English system is the pound mass. A pound force acting on a pound mass will cause it to accelerate with an acceleration of 32.2 meters per second squared. No, not meters, feet. Now you're awake. Thank you. There's also a unit of mass called the slug. That's the amount of mass when accelerated at one foot per second squared requires 32.2 pounds of force to do that. Oh, you can just see the awesome beauty of any system that requires a, a unit called the slug. So, quite obviously, I hope, one pound mass is one over 32.2 slugs. Silly. However, here's what I'd do if I were you with the English system. And it almost always works out. There's a few times where in a problem what you're given requires you to make a conversion. But generally, this is what I would do if I were you. Say that we want to find the mass of an object that has a weight of 40 pounds. Just as an example of how, how we do this. We'll make it simple in that any time you see pounds, we'll take that to be a force in this class. And that's generally the way it's taken in uh, in engineering as well. So if we want to find out what the mass of 40 pounds is, and we're wondering, gosh, do we do ma pounds mass? Do we do slugs? My advice is do neither. 
just make the conversion. In this case, I use the example of 40 pounds. We know the general gravitational field strength to be 32.2 feet per second squared. That comes out to be what? About 1.24. And then without worrying about whether this is pounds, mass, or slugs, just leave it like this. And use that as your units for mass because 9 times out of 10, or even more, 95 out of 100, once you've found the mass, you've got to go through the rest of the problem and the units will just work out anyway. You know, you'll go right back into acceleration or force or whatever it is you're looking at the problem. So that's my advice. Just leave it like that and use that as our units of mass. Don't convert to slugs. Don't forget to pound that. Just forget it. Yeah? Why is it pound second squared over feet? It isn't? So it's, it's a is that supposed to be the actual unit of mass? No, mean? it's not an actual unit of mass. These are actual units of mass, and these are stupid. This isn't stupid because everything you need is right there. You don't have to make a conversion. When you go into a problem, that now you have to take that mass and accelerate it. When you put those units in there, put this in for mass, the units work out perfectly. And you're fine. If you, if you do this, you're on the risk of converting wrong, getting confused. I don't know. That, you can do that if you want. I won't count it wrong, but this, I found, you just don't get wrong. I found students, when they try to think whether they're supposed to be in pound mass or slugs, whichever, they, they make mistakes as often as not. When you do it this way, just leave it like that, and then it comes right back out two seconds later, you're fine. So is it I'm not... I mean, you don't really know, need to know, I guess, but is it slugs or...? That's my point. Who cares? Who cares? 1.24, it's, it's pounds, second squared, per foot. And you're not wrong, then you don't have to worry. You know, you say slugs, you say pounds, mass, and then you roll out in the hallway having a fist fight over that. It's not worth it. Have a fist fight over something important. Leave it like that. Forget this stuff, and you'll be fine. That's my advice. Just trying to make it easier for you. You don't like easy? Do slugs and pound mass. It's just slugs and pound mass are very, very rare in uh, even in, in industry. Rarely used. Trouble was that the mass and the force were defined independently in the English system, where in the SI system, mass was defined first, then the force was defined from that. All right, so that's 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 my advice. I'm your advisor. There you go. All right, just as a reminder of the types of forces we're going to be working with. Applied forces. Those are the ones that show up in a problem as pushes, thrust. Um, you know, anything where, where something outside of the object is acting upon the object. Also, of course, pulls, because you can push on an object as easily as you can pull on it. 
remember though that in general strings tables chains ropes basically anything you'd find in your bedroom those all exert forces only away from the object they only can pull if you can't push anything with a rope you're welcome to try for extra credit and they only pull along their own length. That's good for us because it means of two possible unknowns in a problem involving a pull, one of the unknowns is already figured out. The angle and the direction are figured out. All you'd have to figure out then is the magnitude and of course take care of the units that go with it. So that's good. A lot of the, all you have to worry about with poles is the magnitude. Pushes could be different. Pushes uh, we might have to figure out both the magnitude and the direction. We also have normal forces. Remember, those are the forces exerted by inner objects as our object is being forced upon it. Easiest example is if we have some object. sitting on a table and doing nothing else we know that there must be a force opposing that otherwise it would accelerate down that force we call the normal force and it's actually the resistance of the material itself to this object trying to come through it trying to be pulled through it. It's the molecular forces pushing back on the object. A couple things to remember. Don't forget them. And it's easy to do. This is a contact force. If you don't have two surfaces in contact, you don't have a normal force. A lot of times, a lot of students in a problem will put in something and say, that's the normal force but there's nothing else in contact with the object that we haven't accounted for in some other way, whether it's a push or a string or something. It's only a contact with some other object. It's always perpendicular to the surfaces. That's where we get the word normal. In science, physics and engineering, normal means perpendicular. So it's perpendicular to the surfaces. is always a push on the object in question. It's always directed towards the object from the surface. Now, I do this, it almost looks like it's pulling on the object but uh, that's just because it's long enough to go through the object. I can make them any length I want. So I make them big enough to see. That's good too because if we have normal forces in the problem, we already know their direction. One less unknown to worry about. All we have to worry about is the magnitude of it. When looking for the normal forces, use a free body diagram. If anything ever deserved a pink box, it's 
that. Use a free body diagram. And we'll work on some of those again here to, as a reminder for <coughs> since for most of you it's been a while since physics one. So free body diagrams physics two. Yeah, there are, I think. <laughs> it's a free body diagram free zone. How about that? All right, what else are we going to work with? Uh, friction forces. Again, like normal forces, this is a contact force. Even if it's air in contact with an object, as the air goes over that object, that's, that's still a contact force. So if we don't have two objects in contact, we're not going to have friction for the most part in this class. It's always parallel to the two surfaces in contact which means it's always perpendicular to the normal force at those two surfaces. It always opposes the motion of those two surfaces or impending motion if they're not actually doing it yet. That's one students have a little bit of trouble with sometimes because in general the object might be moving but the two surfaces are not. For example, when you drive your car without skidding. The car is moving, the wheels are turning, the wheels are moving, but where the wheel is in, in contact with the surface of the road, those two surfaces are not sliding, not moving in respect to each other. There's no motion of the two surfaces. You have to look at the surfaces and sometimes disregard what the object itself is doing. And it always opposes the motion of those two surfaces. One surface is to slide, tends to slide to the right with respect to another surface. Friction will oppose that and be to the left. Again, that's good news because we know the direction. Generally, we know. I'm sorry, we know. We know the angle. Generally, we know the direction of the two surfaces. And if you remember, it depends upon the coefficient of friction and the normal force. Because this is the force holding the two surfaces together. You can in fact look at it as a clamping force if you wish. It's the force that's got one surface connected to the other surface and it's between those two surfaces where friction is, is happening. Review for the most part, yeah? No? Got friction in your life? With your parents? No? You didn't get along with your parents? I did too once I disposed of them. <laughs> Oops, confession. Good thing statute of limitations is up. Alright, so that's, that's mostly a review and a reminder. Um, we got to get the normal force right. The best way to do that is with a free body diagram. Otherwise, you're going to cut corners, simplify it too much, make simple mistakes. So, for a simple warm up reminder problem. mass sitting there upon which we are exerting a force. Um, 
equation of kinetic friction 0.3. Uh, what's it mean that I gave you the kinetic friction? It means in this case, the two surfaces are indeed sliding over. There is motion between the two surfaces. All right, just to put some numbers on these. 300 newtons, the mass will uh, make 60 kilograms. And you want to find the acceleration. There, there is something called a kinetic diagram where you also draw in the acceleration or maybe ex expressly draw in the acceleration um, to help with the solution of the problem, but a lot of times it's obvious. Can you get the angle measure? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 30 degrees. All right, simple warm-up one, nothing more than what you had to do with physics one for some of you just weeks ago, huh, Alex? Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. All right, so draw the free body diagram. Oh, here's some, here's some free body diagram advice. All my Physics 1 students know this and they wouldn't be doing it wrong. Free body diagram. The object in question, in this case the one we're pushing on and trying to accelerate, free of any other objects with all pertinent forces applied as best you can in the direction you can. And remember we're working on essentially what are particles. Remember at any point on your free body diagram if you look at it and it's clearly not uh, doing what it should be doing. For example, this one has got to be accelerating down because of the way it's drawn. You know that there are forces missing. Normal force perpendicular to the surface. Friction parallel to the surface. Now remember, we're not worried about the size of this object, so exactly where the forces are is not a concern to us. We're not considering the fact that there might be some moment caused as drawn. These are particles. We just make them big enough to see. Make your free body diagrams big, right? Right, because yours big. Size matters. <laughs> what? Size does matter. The bigger it is, the better. Look how nice and big that is. That's, in fact, uh, um, big and simple because we're thinking football player <laughs> big and simple yeah, no. you're not a football player <laughs> no I mean, Frank were you football player no no you, you play rugby now yeah. yeah so you're not that big not simple and missing teeth I'll put this one. But you don't now. Do you? Yeah. So you saw the light. Oh, dear mom, bro. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, uh, apply that, your love of that, to your three body diagrams. All right, everybody's doing the same problem. We should have the same general solutions. Remember, we're looking for acceleration. We expect it in that direction just because we know what's going to happen with the surface because of the surface it's sliding on. If you do draw the kinetics of the problem, or the kinematic of the problem, draw the acceleration, make it a different vector so you don't accidentally add it into your solution or confuse me with it. Don't agree? Simple problem, let's see. We're expecting acceleration the x direction. So we'll sum the forces in the x direction. We have some little portion of the applied force in the x direction and some little portion in the y direction. That's why we need these diagrams to be nice and big. So, what is that? F? Cosine 30 minus the friction which is in the opposite direction And that's all going on in the x direction, isn't it? That okay so far? And of course, uh, we know the kinetic friction to be uh, a product of the coefficient and the normal force. So we need the normal force. That we find from summing the forces in the y direction. Paying attention to the obvious fact that we don't expect it to accelerate in the y direction. So we've got all the up forces then have got to equal all the down forces. Up, we have the normal force. Down, we have Fy, which is F sine 30. Plus W, which is mg. That's it, right? Helps the nice big diagram. We've got all those pieces. What would you get for the normal force? What? Man, I think I heard something different from everybody. What'd you get? 739. Oh, I heard a bunch of different things. Were you each throwing out one digit? Or were you doing it in code? The best way to find the normal force is with the free body diagram. Too many students just assume the normal force is equal to the weight. And it's not true. In this case, it's increased by the downward force we're applying as the table itself tries to push back by that greater amount. So we're all left with nothing to do but put uh, the acceleration, the normal force up there, get the acceleration. What'd you get? Acceleration? Yeah. 0 0.64 meters per second squared. Yeah? Colin, yeah? Frank? Okay. Bobby? All right. 
Simple as that. Nice warm up. Of course, we're not doing any more problems that easy. Those are physics one problems. This isn't physics one. This is this is physics one point five. All right, so let's look at a different problem. One that's got uh, a little bit more to it, a little bit more of the type of thing we need to do in here. So here's here's a maybe an accelerometer or something. Diagonally across it is a frictionless bar with a, a sliding collar on it. This collar can slide up and down anywhere along that bar. That's 30 degrees. You have to find the acceleration such that the bar neither slides, uh, the, the collar neither slides up or down that bar. It stays right where it should be. If your acceleration is too small, It'll slide down the bar a little bit. If it's too great, it'll slide up the bar. So find A such that that collar stays put. Free, free body diagram is going to be vital to this, I think. Some of you can do it without them. I don't know what kind of creatures you are. Is there a master? 27 gallons. Oh, in English units. No. Of course it's got mass. game plan for yourself if you want. Um, the acceleration, well that's going to come from the forces in the x direction since it's x acceleration only. Got to get all the forces in there. That's going to require a free body diagram. The best way, I think, to get all the forces is a free body diagram. Free body diagram of what? That's a good question. Body diagram of what? Did you say what it's doing again? I missed it. I'm still in my time. We're going to accelerate this cart such that this collar doesn't go up or down on this frictionless bar. It'll stay right where it is. Body diagram of what? A 
couple people are drawing a free body diagram of the cart. A couple are drawing a free body diagram of the collar. Free body diagram of the cart. isn't going to help us much. All we know is we've got the weight of it, whatever that is, and the normal force. We don't know what the weight is, so we don't know what the normal force is, and we weren't even asked to find the force that's doing the accelerating. All we were asked to find is the acceleration itself. So a free body diagram of the cart's not going to do it. It's not going to do it for us. It's not going to help. It just doesn't deal with what we're given and what we're asked for. So a free body diagram of the collar itself. That's the thing we're trying to control. This was a, uh, a very simple type of accelerometer. That's the normal force? Oh, wait, is that the cart or the collar? The collar. I just have the cart. Well, then it's not a free body diagram. Free body diagram means it's free of all other objects. So we were All right. Nice. To sum the forces, whether it's in the x or the y direction or both, we've got to have all the forces. So uh, it's vitally important we get all of the forces in the problem. If we're missing any, we're doing a different problem. If we have too many forces, we're doing a different problem. So give me one force. Known or unknown. As long as it's pertinent to the problem. Weight. Weight, of course. So whoever speaks up first gets the easy one. Friction. Friction was broad or whatever. Friction. Which direction? This one. Both. Neither. Why? I said it was frictionless. This bar oh. is frictionless. Collar slides on it without friction. So don't overcomplicate these things. You have to listen to them carefully, read them carefully. I know sometimes I forget to put something on the board, but ask for it. Any other forces? Well, there must be, because right now, there's no way this is going to accelerate in that direction. It only has a force in the y direction. We couldn't possibly get any a x acceleration out of it. So you can look at the diagram and just tell you're not done. Normal force. Remember, it's a, it's a contact force. It's two surfaces in contact. So what are the two surfaces in contact? The bar, as it accelerates with the cart, is going to push on the collar. So the surface in contact would actually be, depending on how tight that collar is, is how tight that collar is, it actually be that upper surface there as the bar pushes on the collar. How do I draw the normal force then? Perpendicular to the bar. Perpendicular to the bar. So if the bar goes like that, perpendicular to it. So I want you drew, Jake. Yeah, this. Just the technical thing. No, it's not that looks perpendicular to the collar? No, it was sort of. <laughs> In the no, what's that force? It's the force of acceleration. Remember, we need to have all the forces in the problem. Do we? Jake says no. Um, 
Okay. Sooner or later, we're done with the free body diagram. We can go ahead and solve sum the forces. But if any forces are missing, there's no sense doing the sum of the forces if we're not done. You're just wasting effort. And you guys never waste effort. You're efficient, clean running machines. There's got to be a force pushing the cart. Well, yeah, yeah, there's a force pushing the cart, but this isn't a free body diagram of the cart. Jake? The force of acceleration of the collar. Force of acceleration. There's no feeling of force in parallel. Hang on. Here's a rule. Here's a rule for us in this class. And we will not violate this rule. You will try. But I won't let you. All forces. All forces in this class are caused by something something concrete, something real, something tangible something you can touch with your hand. Can you touch the acceleration, Jake? Yeah. <laughs> because it's hooked to the collar, which is hooked to the cart. That's not what I asked. All forces are caused by something real, which means if you give me a force, I can say what causes it, and you have to tell me an object that causes it. What causes the normal force? contact with the bar. The bar is causing it. What's causing the weight? Earth. Earth, that's right. I knew it was something like that. Is that air resistance? No air resistance because this is in the, the vacuum of academe. That was a joke. Alex kind of got it. No air resistance. So this could be, uh, it might not actually be moving yet, we're just getting ready to do it. Just let go of the collar, just got it accelerating. So air resistance isn't a concern yet. What other forces go on here caused by something real? I can't put this force on it because that's a force on the cart. This is a free body diagram of the collar. That force, whatever it is, a jet engine or your hand or who knows what, isn't touching the collar. Doesn't mean it doesn't affect the collar, but it's not touching the collar. Bar. What? A force the bar. Yeah, got it. That's the normal force here. That's the bar pushing on the collar. Until we're done with this, there's nothing else to do. It makes no sense to go sum the forces if you're missing it. For some reason, I think there might be one that is in the opposite direction of the normal vector. Down there? Yeah. Caused by? I'll put it up there if you can tell me what it's caused by. Well, if the car is moving from, by some force, then... Uh, no, that's right there. Have some force in the opposite direction, yeah. But that force isn't connected to the collar in any way. And the carts. Then the carts. The this force pushes on the cart. Part of the cart is that bar. That means the bar starts pushing on the collar, and that's there. There, there isn't any but there isn't any what? More forces on there. But because <laughs> if you're in a car and the car is accelerating, you're still accelerating. What acceleration must the collar have? 
Z not zero must be exactly this acceleration. Because if it goes, if the cart accelerates with A, but the collar moves up, it's accelerating at less. If the collar moves down, it's accelerating at more. It must have exactly the same acceleration. And in fact, that's what we're trying to find. So you couldn't say the force of acceleration. Force causes acceleration. Acceleration doesn't cause force. Acceleration isn't something you can put your hand on. So you're going to need this rule here to stop you. You're going to sit there and look at the problem and say, I just feel like there's something more. I've got to put something more in here. But if you can't think of what real thing is causing it, you might have to think you're done. Because sooner or later, you are done and you have all the forces. Are we done with that free body diagram? Yeah. We are. We are. There's nothing else in this problem that could cause any force on that column. It's only in contact with the earth and in contact with the bar. And we've got all that. There's nothing else going on. There's no friction, no electrostatic, no nothing. There's your free body diagram. Now, sum the forces. It's up to you if you want to incline the xy axes. Your choice of whether you do or not is not going to affect the physics. So do so if you think it's easy. Don't if you don't want to. Generally, put the axes in the direction of the unknown. We're asked to find the acceleration, so generally put the axes in that direction. It just makes the, the algebra a little bit simpler, but it's not required. Comfortable with all the forces on there? Yes. Now make sure those that's different. Give it two arrowheads or something. See, it's blue. That. Because I don't want you accidentally adding that acceleration vector into the other vectors. You might do it, but somebody else might. And you gotta help people. You got it? Who'd you check with? Check with Frank. Frank's always done first. Oh, don't shout it out. Tell him no, you didn't because he didn't send any units. Don't, don't fall for that. He's trying to trick you, TJ. Don't let him. We don't know this guy very well. What? He does have a number. some force in that direction. If we didn't, that would be a big worry because there wouldn't be any force available to give us that acceleration. We've got at least a little bit there. Um, call that, I guess, Nx, which in this case is N sine 30. Um, 
that's all we got going in the x direction. So that's going to give us our x acceleration. Trouble is, we know neither n nor m nor x dot. So now what? Sum the force in the y direction. We're going to have to sum the force in the y direction because we've also got some stuff going on there. See what happens. Um, in the y direction, what should the acceleration be? Zero. Should be zero. We want this to accelerate, stay at the same level, not go up, not go down. So all the up forces equal all the down forces. So that means uh, n cosine 30 equals mg. Is that right? Colin, you got that so far? Can we solve it? Um, then two unknowns, I mean three unknowns, two equations. Well, if you substitute, if you solve for n and from some of the forces in the y direction, substitute back into the uh, Above it, so all the masses will cancel out. The masses will cancel out. In fact, the mass of this collar doesn't matter. The acceleration would be the same no matter what the mass of the collar. If that bar is frictionless. If it wasn't frictionless, which of course in real life it wouldn't be, you're going to need some kind of acceler or some kind of uh, some kind of mass on it. Alright, now it's just substitution substitute one equation in the other the masses cancel right do we see that now it's true sometimes I forget to give you the masses but I was pretty clear here that uh, Solve for n here, put it into there, and solve for x double dot. Uh, 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 the easiest thing to do, I think, is to solve for n here, put it into there, and then the mass was canceled. Don't they? What'd you get? Nothing yet? So you can get one time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now we're getting. Five point seven meters per second squared. Uh, actually, that's uh, assuming uh, SI system, which we didn't need to assume, but. When given the choice, we do. I hope. All right. So be careful of your intuition. The feeling that something else is going on. Your intuition isn't that mature yet. So trust it to a point. But then beyond that, you have to trust the physics. Any questions on that one? All right. Maybe this will be a get out of class question. That'll perk Colin up. If he gets it, a little luncher. truck from my trucking company.
and I'm having delivered my new widescreen TV. Velocity is seven, seven, eight, oh, sorry, kilometers per hour. Find the minimum stopping distance. for it to come to a stop. Without the crate sliding. So the coefficient of static friction there of 0.3. Am I missing anything? I think I'm missing the fact that my cars are always red. It's just so awesome. That even looks good. I like that paint job. Find the minimum stopping distance so that the crate doesn't slide. Stop shorter than that. You need to put on the brakes too hard. The crate's going to slide some into the back of the truck. Stop longer than that, and you don't have a minimum. So there's a minimum distance. Allow us to find just what it takes to stop the crate without sliding. So, again, a free body diagram. Let's see. Delta uh, S. Let me double check. Nope. No mass of the crate. It's going to be the same for any crate. Doesn't matter if you have a ton of feathers or a ton of lead in there. You get it? It's one of two science jokes in the world. Alright, let's see. The minimum stopping distance. Well, we've got initial velocity, final velocity, we're trying to find delta S, then we better have some other unknown. What, maybe the acceleration? Uh, actually, we need the acceleration of the truck because that's what's going to go that distance. Um, oh, and that's got to be the same as the acceleration of the crate since they don't move in relation to each other. No sliding. That was the, the uh, criteria. And that we're going to get from, I think, sum of the forces. That's going to come from a free body diagram. So there's, there's, a, there's our problem GPS. Sense. We have a free body diagram. We can sum the forces, get the acceleration. From the acceleration, we can get the minimum distance. Because we'll assume no sliding. That'll minimize the distance automatically. We don't have to take the derivative and set it to zero or any of that kind of stuff. Not on this one, please. So, free body diagram of what? Is that why you're so fast? Yeah. And making a really small free body diagram is quicker? Yeah. Yeah. 
And always assuming the normal force is equal to the weight, that's quicker too. Yeah. Always to save time. Of course, you lose it if you have to take the class over again, but you're right, it's, it's a get out of class question. You can go. You got it. Take this first before? I don't think so. You don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I know you didn't take it from me. Uh, uh, you might want to check your, your transcript. Uh, uh, so All right, free body diagram of what? The crate. Free body diagram of the crate will give us the acceleration of the crate. That's automatically the acceleration of the truck. So free body diagram of the crate. Get all the forces on it, such as? Who goes first? J goes first, gets the weight. Gets the easy one. Let's sit back now. DJ? Normal. Normal force. Perpendicular to the surface is in contact. It's the crate in contact with the truck bed. Other forces. Friction. Since we're dealing with particles, if you want to draw it like that, that's fine. I tend to put it at the surface itself just to remind me that you don't need it. Is it in that direction? Is it in that direction? Well, there's only three possibilities where uh, we stop at just the right distance. The other one, let's see, we stop too hard. In that case, the crate would be sliding forward and then the friction force is correct. The other case is we don't brake hard enough. Then what would happen? Crate still would the, the, the crate wouldn't slide, its tendency, no matter what, is to slide forward. If we didn't break enough, it doesn't change the direction of friction, it means we just don't get our minimum distance here. So that's got to be the direction of the friction. That will give us the acceleration of the crate. That will give us the acceleration of the truck. Then we have one, two, three things we know. One thing we don't. We can assume the acceleration is constant and then use constant acceleration equations. So you got two minutes before you can get out of class. Frank can go, but he doesn't want to. He's afraid he'll miss the second physics joke ever. No, on get out of class questions, you can't check with each other. Because then all of a sudden, magically, everybody's got the answer and here we go. So now you all have to stay. I'm leaving. <laughs>